Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so yeah, this uh, work is a collaboration between my lab at the Salk Institute and Dr. Barbara Kahn's lab at Beth Israel Medical Treatment Center in Boston, and uh, she's also part of Harvard Medical School. And uh, Barbara's lab is uh, very focused on trying to understand uh, the link between obesity and diabetes. And she developed several uh, animal models to be able to study this process. And in one animal model, what she found is that she was able to break the link between obesity and, and diabetes. That is, the animals were obese, but they didn't actually have any kind of diabetes. And some of the uh, information, uh, preliminary information from those animals suggested that one thing that was happening is that they were actually producing more fat, uh, uh, fat tissue, which was a little bit of a strange result because we usually associate fat with, with negative outcomes in diabetes. And so she and I began a collaboration. My lab focuses on using analytical chemistry, mostly mass spectrometry, uh, to analyze lipids from complex biological samples. And so we started a collaboration to identify the exact uh, species that were changing in, in her animal model. And through this work, uh, we actually discovered that what was happening is in her animal model, there was an elevated lipid that had never been described before. Um, when we looked for it, we found it everywhere we looked, but we were the first people to actually identify the structure and characterize it. And so uh, we set about um, really trying to, to functionally characterize this thing. And so my lab did a lot of synthesis, her lab did a lot of pharmacology, and then we also uh, started looking to see if these lipids were actually present in people. And to do this, we collaborated with uh, a longtime clinical collaborator of, of Dr. Kahn's, uh, Ulf Smith, who's at the University of Gothenburg. And Ulf had identified a cohort of patients that uh, basically were equivalent in every way possible, except one group uh, was insulin resistant, they had diabetes, and the other group wasn't. And when we measured these lipids, what we discovered is that they were actually lower in the people that had uh, insulin resistance, which made us wonder if we actually gave these lipids to an animal or a person eventually, uh, would it be able to reverse uh, some of the phenotypes that are associated with diabetes? And sure enough, if we treat mice with these lipids, uh, all their diabetic parameters uh, improve, uh, their blood glucose lowers, they uh, have improved uh, tolerance to glucose, uh, and it really looks a lot like uh, the types of results you get from a, a drug-like compound except this is a natural lipid that's, that's made in all our bodies. Right, so, so naturally they're found at, at nanomolar concentrations in the blood. Uh, they're also found in pretty much every tissue at hundreds of picomoles per gram quantity. Um, these concentrations are on the order of other types of signaling lipids like prostaglandins and other hormones that we're familiar with. Uh, and when we do the experiments where we, uh, uh, we, we feed these to animals, uh, their blood levels go up about threefold from the normal levels. So. Um, maybe up to um, you know two to three hundred nanomolar, depending on the specific lipid, uh, to, to get the effect. So it's not a, a very high dose uh, compared to normal. It's just bumping it up a little bit uh, to, to get the effect we're seeing. Right. Well, so so there's there's um, I guess there's different questions, and from a therapeutic standpoint, it'd be fine to go ahead and, and make uh, you know, cocktails of these, these lipids and, and be able to deliver them. One thing I should mention is that there's more than one lipid, it's a family of lipids, and so it, it would be difficult to recreate that by you know, giving somebody a cocktail of 10 or 15 lipids. So in the end, we're not 100% sure yet if uh, the uh, delivering the lipid is the best way for elevating their levels. It might be that we get even better effects if we actually uh, prevent their degradation in vivo. And so, um, but then from a more basic uh, science perspective, it's also, uh, we discovered these lipids and it really means there's a metabolic pathway out there for regulating them. So it's, it's you know, out of curiosity for kind of the basic science and understanding the enzymology for making them. But from a therapeutic standpoint, you're correct that um, we should be able to get away with uh, just delivering the, the lipids.
So, so people that have insulin resistance or have uh, a phenomenon associated with type 2 diabetes has a lower effect, but we haven't gone and we haven't gotten to that point yet where we've tried to look at genetics to be able to make a link uh, between that, um, between a specific gene or a gene target and the levels of these lipids. Uh, if we do characterize, for example, the, the proteins that are necessary for making and breaking these things down, then we could do a much more targeted analysis of that to look, for example, in people that are type 2 diabetic, do they have mutations in genes that might produce these lipids, or are they, do they have overactive versions of the proteins that degrade them, for example, because we think that higher levels are actually beneficial in this gene. So there might be there, there might be the, the challenges that we just discovered them. So, um, you know, there hasn't been, outside of our paper, there hasn't been any studies uh, published. And so um, there's a good chance that other, other lipids, that uh, other compounds or drugs that actually affect uh, insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes might also affect the levels of these lipids, but we haven't done those studies yet. No, um, so so we don't. I mean, we have found these in. So so there's two components to the regulation. There's uh, you can you can obtain these lipids from food. So we found them in all kinds of humans: food, broccoli, um, meat, chicken, eggs. Um, but you know their levels are fairly low, so it's unclear how much that actually contributes to uh, the endogenous pool. And then the second is that um, we have evidence that there's basically capacity within tissues to actually produce these lipids. Um, and in the case where we discovered these lipids, it was essentially looking at two animals on equivalent diets, and one animal had higher levels of these. So the, the metabolism was actually the reason that they were up, not the food. But in human populations, it, I think you'd have to also take into consideration that diet could probably impact the levels or types of, of these lipids that you'd actually end up with. And so uh, that's something we don't know about yet and, you know, something that we'd, we'd really uh, need to look at, for example, what foods actually have the highest levels of these and then study if, if diet is, is able to, uh, to regulate them. We do know that they're orally available, which is something that would at least uh, venture a guess that there should be some effect from, from diet. Right. So, so um, through our work, uh, this was actually the idea of the first author on the paper, Mark Dior, uh, who suggested that these are fatty acid-like molecules, so we should look at known fatty acid receptors to see if, if these could activate those. And these uh, molecules activate a receptor called GPR120. And this receptor has also been shown to be a receptor for the omega-3 fatty acids, so the, the ones in fish oils. And what we believe is that uh, fish oil is something you have to eat. Your body doesn't make those omega-3 fatty acids, whereas it looks like these lipids are produced in the body. So what it might be is that this receptor is actually being controlled by both, both types of molecules, one from diet and then these that are produced endogenously. Um, and at least our preliminary data is pretty clear that for the activities that we observe that you need GPR-120 there to get that activity. Now, I will say that we don't believe that that's the only receptor. Um, there is some evidence that there are other receptors in cases where GPR120 isn't thought to activate the biology. Um, but um, right now, at least, it gives us a class and a starting point of GPCRs to start looking at for a function. Chip? Um, so there's several directions we're going in. Um, the lipids we studied were one out of many. So it, because of their structures, you can actually uh, you find a, a library of them in the body that differ just based on the number of carbons and number of double bonds they have. And so one question is uh, we focused on, on one that was fairly abundant and was changing fairly strongly in at least the models we looked at. Um, but there's possibilities that these other uh, variants of these molecules might be as potent or might have different functions. And so one area is to definitely focus on what these other molecules are doing. The second area, again, is to try and tease out and understand the entomology and the biology of, of these things so that we can actually start to perturb their levels endogenously where 
right now we can we can raise their levels because we can feed animals with this, but we don't have the ability to like knock them down. And so if we knew what enzyme made them, for example, that would give us a, a new avenue to study them mechanistically. And then two other things that were uh, in our paper. One was again, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's this correlation between uh, type two diabetes and the levels of these lipids. And that was done on a cohort, but the cohort was fairly small. It was about 20 people or so. And so the idea would be to see if, that, if we could expand that and if these become actually a bona fide marker uh, for the onset of, of diabetes. And lastly, um, we're really trying to, um, we're in the process of getting the types of data that you need, like toxicology and other things like that, uh, to push forward with uh, eventually trying these in humans to see if the effects that we see in animals are, are recapitulated in people. Okay, so the, the fatty acids are, they're a combination, so we, we named them, we called them FAFAs, so F-A-H-F-A's, which stands for fatty acid esters of hydroxy fatty acids. And we have actually found at least 16 different families, which means that the acyl chains can vary from C16 to C18 and have you know, anywhere from one to more double bonds uh, in there. And the hydroxyl group positions, we've only really focused on one fatty, uh, one member of this family, and that is a palmitic acid hydroxyceric acid, uh, or PASA. And for that one, we find evidence for eight different isomers, which refers to eight different positions of the hydroxyl group, uh, starting at 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11, 12, and 13. Monohydroxy, yeah. The S is verified with another fatty acid. Is that what you're asking? Okay. Um, so if you look at the the structure up there, right, the hydroxy fatty acid is insulated with another. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, these are these are unusual in that, you know, we weren't able to find any evidence for these. If you look hard enough, you'll find that there are some natural products that are made by insects and other things that look a little similar in that they're branch structure, but uh, nothing like this has really been found in mammalian tissues. So interestingly, we, we, didn't, uh, we didn't think about that because we're not plant biologists, but after the paper, we were contacted by a bunch of plant biologists, and there are some derivatives in plants that, that look similar. Uh, hydroxy fatty acids in plants have been um, much much better studied than they have been in mammalian systems because it turns out that people are very interested in understanding the amount of hydroxy fatty acid because it, it can control seed oil viscosity. And so the pathways for making hydroxy fatty acids and things like that are, are well worked out in, in plants. But surprisingly, uh, if you look at the literature in mammalian cells or even eukaryotes for that matter, uh, there's very little known, and in terms of the biochemistry, we're not really sure, for example, what's generating these hydroxy fatty acids or how they're being made uh, in cells and tissues, and that's another very important question that we're, we're looking forward to answering in the future. Um, well, so so I think in, the, in looking at this, the hard part is that we were able to fairly quickly get the structure of these lipids and we were able to find that they were changed in these animal models and we could do the measurements in, in humans, but really you start out with something where there's no um, biology to, 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 to begin with and it really took about two years of trying a variety of, you know, we had rationales for all of them, uh, different experiments until we were actually able to get pinned down uh, the biology of these things and get to a point where we could make predictions and, and actually have them work out the way we wanted. There were a lot of experiments that we tried, uh, you know, to, that you know, didn't work or didn't work as well as we thought they were going to work in this search process. But I think that's natural anytime you deal with something, uh, something new. Uh, 